Hello everybody and welcome to my uh, third in-depth analysis series. This time we will be talking about the Hunter, <clears throat> one of my uh, favorite classes and my all-time top performing class in the arena in GVG. Well, I suppose it's not all-time, but either way, uh, I think I finished Hunter at around 8.2 uh, average wins per run which is probably one of the highest in the world even in and we're talking about arena averages in the gvg period um this hunter run will be the um uh in the tgt meta of course i've had a little bit of time to play with all the cards and it was a very entertaining and educational run because i think hunter is one of the most fun classes to play into the arena because it has this very fine line um, about like you have to deal with the board at some point and you have to deal face damage at another point. You don't have the luxury of sitting back a little bit longer because your hero power and your cards in general are just focused at closing the game out slightly faster than other classes because you know you're just dealing face damage with your hero power. Uh, so it, you get really punished for missing face damage, but you can also get punished for going face too early, leaving your opponent with a minion, and then that gets a buff from a Dark Iron Dwarf, etc., etc. So really excited to do this uh, in-depth analysis. So we're going to dive right in, guys, like we always do, just with the drafts. There we go. Boop. There we go. A little smaller here. Uh, this was um, on stream. It was a uh, coaching run with Epiphany. Tiffany is a great arena player himself, and uh, like he was, um, he was interested in getting better at Hunter. He had been doing uh, well for himself, of course, but uh, there's there's no uh, there's no harm in trying to sharpen the blade a little bit more. So as I said, this is the first analysis series in TGT, and there are going to be some cards where, where at the time i wasn't 100 percent sure about even now tgt has been out for roughly a week so there are going to be some cards that i might be evaluating wrong but this particular run did go 12 and 0 so i mean it's it did it did perform really nicely so the the general hunter principles from gvg still apply in in tgt of course so most of um, most of the things are figured out uh, right now. So yeah, let's let's uh, go and start the analysis, shall we? So the first cards, Ball of Spiders, Mogos Champion, Matter Bomber. I hadn't played with Ball of Spiders yet, and um, it just seemed like the best card in the pack. Like Matter Bomber usually is just going to throw bombs on your own guys, because as a hunter you should be uh, playing really aggressive, have lots of early game minions, so by the time turn 5 comes around, you should be the one to have slightly more minions on the board. And as statistically, a matter bomber is just going to be worse for you than for your opponent. You're going to throw bombs on your own guys. I know sometimes the matter bomber is great, sometimes the matter bomber just does whatever you want it to. But we can treat Ball of Spiders as a draw mechanic. Um, a good comparison would be a sprint. You know, in Rogue, you draft a fairly low curve. And then you grab a sprint at the end so that you know you can have lots of two drops three drops and then when turn seven eight nine comes around you just use that sprint grab four new cards and you're not going to run out of steam as fast as you would without the draw card so here i'm uh, i'm very fine picking the uh, ball of spiders it's also just for science you know gotta gotta try things out there's going to be a couple picks for science in this draft but they worked out really nicely so so, um, for the next pick, let me just, uh, so it's pretty sure we're going to pick it really fast here. I don't want to mess, uh, <laughs> with the fast forward thing. I know that, uh, sometimes I click too far. There we go. All right, the next pick, it's, um, it's pretty interesting. Oh, sorry. There we go. We have the Fairy Dragon, Argent Horse Rider, and Snapjaw. Argent Horse Rider is not a bad card. But there are so many premium threes around. You've got your Ogre Brood, you've got your Spider Tank. In particular in Hunter, you've got an extra one with Animal Companion. Uh, if you get a rare, you could get an Eagle Horn Bow. So I feel like there's so many premium threes around that I'd rather pick up a solid two if I can. So in this case, that would be the uh, Fairy Dragon. Because uh, you need you need enough two drops here. Worgen Infiltrator is a very easy pick. Uh, I've, I've noticed, especially in TGT, that your one drop is is so important 
because the inspire mechanic now really really rewards the person that is ahead on the boards Mukla's champion for instance is almost a broken card if you are ahead on the board just giving your entire board plus one plus one with the potential of doing that again next turn whereas if you're not the aggressor if you're not the one that's um, ahead on the board Mukla's champion is super bad you know it's a three health minion that's not going to survive it's not going to do anything so by ensuring that you have your uh, your turn one play you are more likely to be ahead on the board and then your inspire cards are also a lot more likely to work uh, really nicely so i feel in tgt even though people said the meta was going to slow down it has become even more important to hit your turn one because those inspire cards can just uh, reward you so much for grabbing the board early here it's a fairly easy Arcane Shot, 1 mana, 2 damage is fine. Elven Archer is not terrible, but I, I, the, the, the Arcane Shot can also be used as Reach. Here we have kind of an unfortunate pick. Uh, none of these cards are, are great, but we're going to go and pick up Illuminator because a 2-4 for 3 is acceptable, a 2-2 two, two for 2, not so much. And the Argent Watchman, of course, as Hunter, we don't want to hero power early because it just loses us boards. Okay, so here I'm going to pause really fast because Glaive Zuka is slam dunk. <laughs> Uh, I've been I've been playing Hunter for quite a while in the arena and Glaive Zuka is just the best Hunter card. I can just like for me it's the number one. So it's up to a point that the first three Glaive Zukas that I see are auto picks. It doesn't really matter what they're up against. <laughs> you just pick the first three Glaive Zukas that you see. Now there can be a very uh, occasional um, a pick where your third Glaive Zuka is going to be up against uh, a two drop minion and you only have two two drop minions at that time you're probably gonna want to go towards the two drop but in general the first three out of the first three Glaive Zukas that you see you're just going to slam dunk so uh, Epiphany knows this and he just uh, slams it here okay this one is interesting I think this is the first really interesting pick because ship's cannon in general is is not bad it's a two three it synergizes nicely with the glaive but as I said you know it's so important to hit your one drop in the TGT meta because of the inspire cards um, and just in in general that um, when people build a bit slower and you curve out really hard you're just going to win some games by default because you went one two three four and they went like uh, skip turn one hero power turn two you've practically lost if your opponent goes one two three four and you don't have a turn two play that's you know that's pretty much you can't really recover from that unless you have um double blizzard or you know some crazy stuff like that so because of uh that reasoning i like the Argent squire here Argent squire is also amazing with the glaive zuka getting that buff on her is yeah very nice okay this one's interesting i've spoken about mukla's champion and about how it's uh, really not a bad card if you are ahead on the board. However, Amani Berserker is so good. Uh, like this card, you can play it into Consecrations. You can play it into Holy Novas and say like, okay, go ahead, man. AOE my board down, but I'm going to get a 5-1 and one for 2 mana, which, uh, which is pretty good. I mean, a 5-1 and one after the AOE, of course. Um, so really nicely. Amani Berserker also synergizes very well with Glaive Zuka. Bring that up to a 3-3, three and three, letting it hit someone. Then it becomes a 6-1 and one or a 6-2. and two. Just, you know, just a really, really solid uh, minion. So in terms of like early curve, the Amani Berserker is the safe pick and the best pick, according to me. Because uh, right now the deck is looking like it's going to be a very curvy hunter. We're just going to curve out nicely. Sometimes a hunter will have just more reach and then the curve is not so good. You know, you have like two, three kill commands to unleash the hounds, you know, maybe some end game charge minions. Um, but that is not the case here. We are just going to for we are just going to draft a very solid curve hunter that just has enough plays on turn one, turn two, turn three, turn four. That's like the, the four most imp like important turns, in my opinion. Now, this pick is pretty interesting. Because I did mention that there are a lot of premium 3s, and this is one of them, Ogre Brute. And we did pick up the Fairy Dragon and the Amani Berserker already, so we are not really in trouble for 2 drops right now. So I would pick up the Ogre Brute here. It's just a 4-4 four, four for 3 is great. A lot of people dislike the card because it can miss. But, I mean, on turn 3, if it goes phase, it's 4 phase damage. It's not bad. And, I mean, there's really not a bad target it can hit on turn 3. 
There are maybe some exceptions when you have like a Scarlet Crusader that you don't want to hit into or an Emperor Cobra. But in general, I kind of compare the Ogres like a Bulldozer. You just unleash them on the enemy's board and then, you know, you're not too fussed about where they're going. Uh, the handicap of the Ogre becomes more important later on to game when the board states become a little bit more complex when your opponent has um, four minions and you really need to hit the minion you're targeting and then you miss into his five dropping like oh now my ogre died to his spiteful smith for free um, but i draft my cards for to play them on curve uh, especially in hunter uh, it's really a big theme for me is that i don't really treat cards for the the utility that they might have later in the game I, I look at cards and say like, okay, what do you do for me on the turn I want to play you? So with the Ogre, you want to play him on turn three. That's my general philosophy when I'm, uh, when I'm drafting a deck. Here, second ball of spiders or Ram Wrangler. Uh, Abomination, I think, is almost unpickable. For the same reason that we didn't want to pick Matter Bomber, you're just going to blow up your own board, especially if you're playing this, this curve style hunter. You're going to get ahead on the board, and then you're just going to give that up by blowing it up. That makes no sense. I hadn't played with the Ram Wrangler yet, and right now, the deck... I mean, there's really not that many beasts, but we are still early in the draft, and we do have Ball of Spiders, which could provide us with some beasts. So, just trying out the Ram Wrangler here. Uh, it, it usually ends up to be a unreliable Silverhand Knight that is either going to be a bit underwhelming, summon a 3-3, and say another 2-3 three, or 3-3, three, three, sometimes an angry chicken, and sometimes it's going to just summon uh, a King Crush or a Malorn or a Maixna. So here is that uh, second glaive, there we go, slam dunk. It was up against the Gilblin Stalker, which is a very respectable minion, and a minion that even synergizes very well with the glaive, but I mean, I'd rather pick the glaive than the minion that synergizes with the glaive. Here, Animal Companion, also fairly easy. Uh, almost all the animals are far above their, um, their, their counterparts on the curve. It's just that sometimes you really don't want the Leoc and you get the Leoc. Sometimes you really don't want a Huffer when the opponent has a Loot Order and you get the Huffer. So that's the only downside of Animal Companion. But usually this, this is insane. Uh, Misha is probably the best one that you can get on turn 3. A 4-4 four, four taunt with accuracy that is just... Ogre Brute blown out of the water, and uh, when later in the game the opponent's on 4 HP, you'd rather roll a Huffer and then just uh, close the game out. Here Dark Iron Dwarf is a fairly easy pickup. We don't have any turn 4 yet, and Dark Iron Dwarf is again one of those cards that really rewards you for having initiative. It synergizes very nicely with having lots of 1-drops, because if you have enough 1-drops, you're going to get onto the board, and if you're the one that's on the board, you're the one that's going to be utilizing buffs such as Dark Iron Dwarf, Abusive Sergeant, Shadowed Sun Cleric, so all those cards go up in value when your curve is uh, looking nicely. Uh, here, quick shot, fairly easy pick, 2 mana, 3 damage, just solid, the rest was pretty bad. Snapjaw is the only card for me here, Tournament Medic, not really what we're looking for. Goldshire Footman, not unplayable, but you already have two very respectable 1-drops, so we're not too in trouble, especially because we're only halfway through the draft. Snapjaw does have synergy with the Ram Wrangler. You know, you can put it on the board. And, I mean, when's the last time they cleared your Snapjaw in one go? Uh, probably when it got Kodo'd, but... <laughs> uh, normally, a Snapjaw survives, and then on turn 5, you can just Ram Wrangler, get your free beast. Uh, not, not that bad. Uh, Houndmaster, once again, fairly easy pick, because it synergizes really nicely with the Snapjaw. So it's looking like we are building a deck with a bit more beast synergy. Okay, uh, this is another very interesting pick, I would say. I believe that at the time, Epiphany was like, okay, I really want the Ogre. And then I looked at the curve and I said, hmm, we have an Animal Companion, we have an Ogre Brute, we have an Illuminator. We already have three three drops. I'm generally look looking for four to five three drops. Four to five three drops usually is enough for me uh, for the curve. So when I'm looking at my uh, two drops, I'm like, hmm. I've got a Fairy Dragon and an Amadi Berserker. That is just one less than the three drops. And I usually want to have six playable minions on turn two. So playable minions uh, do not include uh, a Direwolf, for instance. Direwolf for me is not a playable minion on turn two because it, it is a utility minion that you drop on turn three, turn four, sometimes on turn two to buff up your one drop, but more often than uh, not, it is going to be a weak two drop. Um, so here I, I would just pick up the Fairy Dragon it's not a bad minion, it can get frostbolted, can get dark bombed, it's, um, 
it's it's a very it's a very solid minion so no problem with the fairy dragon here I believe we're just uh, discussing it at the moment and Epiphany's telling me his arguments I'm telling uh, him my arguments and go with the Drake in the end and I'm glad we did because Scarlet Crusader pops up a premium three drop very nicely okay this one's pretty interesting they're all pickable I'd say the Jormungar probably is the worst card um, because of the way how we're drafting this particular deck this is a very uh, early mid game oriented deck that is going to grab the board uh, turn one turn two turn three turn four so picking up a seven drop is usually not that interesting Kill Command's not a bad card. I think a lot of people here look at Kill Command like, wow, easy Kill Command, you know, we're Hunter, gotta get that face damage in. But, Adam, but as I mentioned earlier, we are building this, this curve style Hunter. And, you know, I'm just gonna be mentioning that a lot because people gotta um, look at classes and try to differentiate between different styles. You can have one style of Hunter perform really nicely and then another style of Hunter also perform really nicely. But you need to know what kind of a deck you're drafting. And right now we are drafting a deck that just curves out really nicely, plays as 1-drop, 2-drop, 3-drop, 4-drop, goes aggressive from that point on to close the game out fast. We are not playing the uh, quote-unquote like crash and burn Hunter. That's how I like to call it. A crash and burn Hunter has like three kill commands, an arcane golem, a reckless rocketeer, uh, maybe even a gladiator's longbow, and you just kind of try to get by in the early game, and then you just come out of the blue in two turns and deal 20 damage with like uh, charge minion and hero power, weapon, and then double kill command to turn after. So that kind of a hunter can be very efficient, but you need to have plenty of reach to achieve that. And I feel that if you if you build a deck a bit half and half, you know, you go like, all right, I'll pick up some reach and then I'll pick some curve and then we'll see what happens. It's like a deck performs a lot better. A deck is a lot more consistent if your draft is consistent. So right now we've been drafting for this on curve play uh, style. So we should pick the curve card, which is the Yeti. Like the utility card is the, the kill command. So... I, it's just trying to um, bring that across because that is a very uh, nuanced point, I feel. Like, that is not very easy to get. There's there's a lot of, like, uh, like you can't say, like, okay, it's always Yeti or it's always Kill Command. So try to look at your deck, try to see what it does, how it wins, and then see, like, which card is going to pay off more. Uh, this, is, this is almost with every class. You can have multiple play styles. Uh, a mage deck can be very aggressive with double mana worm, double... Fireball, it can also be very control-like with a Blizzard of Flamestrike and two Boulder Fist Ogres, for instance. Right. So try to identify what your deck does. Uh, here it's the Power Shot. The other two cards are really not that good. I'm not a huge fan of Power Shot right now because, once again, if you curve out so aggressively, your opponent is most likely not going to be ahead on the board. And then that Power Shot is more likely than not going to be just an expensive Arcane Shot. Um, but, you know, sometimes it deals 4 damage. It's fairly rare that it's going to deal the full 6 damage if you are curving out really nicely. Because if you go 1 drop, 2 drop, 3 drop, 4 drop, uh, I mean, you have to be doing something really wrong if your opponent has 3 minions on the board. Unless he goes, of course, like Murloc, Tide, Hunter, Wisp, you know. <laughs> Anyone can do that, right? <laughs> then Power Shot is suddenly amazing. But more, more likely than not, it's going to sit in your hand and be a bit awkward. Alright, here... I feel like it's up between the Colosseum Manager and the Ram Wrangler. Colosseum Manager is not the worst card in Hunter, because early game you're not going to be one of hero powering. Um, but we already have plenty of three drops. The Ram Wrangler is fun, and right now we have that Snapjaw. We have the uh, Ball of Spiders. We picked up Animal Companion. So we are going slightly more towards the Beast archetype. Uh, and here, this is once again a great example. Um, web spinner really really helps out with that curve style play uh, it's another one drop that helps us grab the board uh, the web spinner helps out with the ram wranglers with the hound master whereas kill command would have been the pick if we were more in that crash and burn style hunter which can do very well i've had plenty of 12 wins with the crash and burn uh, style hunter i've also had plenty of 12 wins with the curve hunter so i'm not going to say one is better than the other but you have to work with what the draft gives you. And right now, the Web Spinner just seems a lot more logical than the other card. 
Okay, here I was leaning slightly more towards the Rocketeer, but it made no sense because once again Rocketeer is like that, that more into that crash and burn style. So at at the time, of course, when you're analyzing a draft and when you've, you know, you've really got the entire deck in front of you, you've got every pick that you have more time to dissect and go like this. For me now, it's a very obvious freezing trap, but at the time I was looking at the Rocketeer, I was like, eh, we don't really have a six yet. It could close out the game, but it makes no sense to draft it over freezing trap because freezing trap is going to benefit you really hard when you just curve out um you know turn uh turn five you put your freezing trap down after you played your yeti they play their pit fighter you can just ignore the pit fighter they attack with the pit fighter pit fighter gets frozen suddenly you have a huge advantage on the board that your opponent probably can't recover from so um yeah it's it's uh it's definitely freezing trap but at the time i was just really debating like hmm, do we need the reach to close out the game uh uh, so it's it's really nice that you can see like everybody can learn from that. Even I even I learned from uh, these analysis uh, series. Okay, uh, for me it's a fairly easy King's Alec here. We'll go over the two drops right now. One, two, three. We've only got three playable cards on turn two. I do not count Glaivezukas because Glaivezukas are kind of sad to play if you don't have something to buff. Now that doesn't mean that you can't play them, right? Like you'll you'll play Glaivezuka if it's between Glaivezuka and Hero Power, but you usually want to coin out a 2-drop and then play Glaivezuka, or have a 1-drop and then play Glaivezuka. So we try to force that situation, and King's Alec is just a good card. Sometimes it will draw you a card, and if not, it is just a uh, Bloodfen Raptor. There's nothing wrong with a Bloodfen Raptor. Okay, Shadowed Sun Cleric, another one of those cards that really rewards you having a lot of uh, early game. You know, if you have your 1-drop, your 2-drop, you're probably going to have something on the board, and then Shadowed Sun is a very good card. Abusive Sergeant, exactly the same scenario. If you have a good early game, Abusive Sergeant is a very good card. Uh, here we can pick one Unleash the Hounds. We had we had none yet, and Unleash the Hounds uh, can be decent for the game where the game goes on slightly longer than expected. And as a curve hunter, you will lose the board at some point, right? You're not gonna have that many six drops. You're probably not gonna have a seven drop, like. Heck, I mean, I think if I recall correctly, this deck will not have six drops. So the most expensive card will be a Ram Wrangler, which is hardly, you know, like a... Sorry, no, Pit Fighter. We're going to pick up a Pit Fighter here. But I mean, so Pit... Uh, I mean, Ram Wrangler and Pit Fighter have the same cost, but you know what I mean, right? Pit Fighter is more of a, a sturdy card. So with Pit Fighter being the, um, like, the pinnacle of our of, of our curve, the, the Unleash the Hounds can come into play at around, you know, turn... Um, Turn six, seven, eight, you know, the time where your opponent is going to play the Bulldefist Ogre, the Force Tank, you know, you're going to start to ignore your opponent's board a little bit more. They're going to add more minions after that. And then you unleash and you try to finish them off. So having one unleash is really not bad. But in this kind of deck, I would not want more than one because it can it can just sit in your hand uh, for sure. But yeah, Pit Fighter here, easy pick. Um, it's the new Yeti. It's a five, six for five. Very strong. Should should almost always be picked. Flame Juggler here, great, great for the curve. Like as I said, we really needed another two, and Flame Juggler is, can just win you the game if it shoots your opponent's um, web spinner or Worgen infiltrator. You're in a very good spot. All right, here we are, guys. The last card, Emperor Cobra, seems fairly obvious. It's a beast. It's good removal. Uh, it synergizes with your Houndmaster, with your two Ram Wranglers. Uh, it's just, it's fairly nicely. So I really like this deck. Uh, as you can see, we have good early game. I think when I like, I wrote a curve down here. Uh, we ended up with four one drops, of which there's three you really want to play on turn one, and there's one you will play if you have to. Uh, the abusive soldier, uh, sorry, the abusive sergeant, you will play if you really have to on turn one. But uh, usually you're gonna want to play one of the other ones. So four one drops, that's fine. Yeah, I usually want around three if I'm playing this kind of hunter. So three, four, that's that's fine, no problem. Uh, two drops, I think we're one short. We have one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yes, so we have five playable twos on turn two, uh, but we do have two Glaive Zookas, a quick shot, a freezing trap, and the one drops. So it's not, it's not super uh, uncomfortable. We're just one short, and we have the Glaive Zookas to make up for it, and sometimes you can quick shot on turn two, so it's not ideal, but it's definitely 
not bad you know um five two drops plus um uh, two glyphs to cast that's 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 very solid uh, i would even argue that it's better to have the five two drops and two glyphs to cast than just six two drops because glyphs to cast as i said they're my favorite hunter card uh three drops we ended up with six playable trees uh one two three four f one two three four five six yeah so six with the animal companion now that's slightly too much but it's fine shadowed sun cleric has her value later in the game and illuminator is not like a great three drop anyway so we have four great three drops to play on curve the animal companion the cobra the brute and the crusader and then shadowed sun is also amazing if you have a minion on board then we go on turn four turn four is fine we have four playable fours uh, houndmaster is obviously amazing if you have an animal companion out earlier or a cobra Sometimes it will be a bad curve play. Dwarf is almost always going to be very good with this deck on curve. Uh, Yeti, super solid. And Snapjaw is surprisingly okay on 4 because we have those double Ram Wranglers coming down on turn 5. So um, just make sure that we have that activation, get that Silverhand Knight mechanic going. Pit Fighter is fine, there's no problem with curving out with that. I would have even taken one Bulldefist Ogre uh, if, it wasn't a if it wasn't up against that King's Alec. So I, I can curve out like with one six drop as well. That's no problem. Uh, but it, it ended up to be the, the most expensive uh, minion here, the Pit Fighter and the Ram Wranglers. And then Ball of Spiders to refuel. Should the game go a bit longer and we reach the time where we're kind of running out of cards because the deck that has the uh, least expensive cards is going to run out of cards faster because your opponent will spend eight mana on a force tank max you'll spend 8 mana on 2 2 drops and a 4 drop, right? So you're going to run out of cards a lot faster than your opponent, but that's no problem if you just have enough of an advantage on the board early and you have that ball of spiders to get some more card advantage afterwards. So that's no problem. Okay, guys, I hope that you really enjoyed this draft analysis. I know I have, and I'm also looking forward to analyzing all the games here. Uh, I did say that it was a 12-0, so... It's, uh, but it's very entertaining, right? There are also some close games here and there, so definitely not just uh, one, one big stomp fest. So, guys, thank you all so much for tuning in, and I will see you all tomorrow for the first game of the Hunter series.